Hi everyone, my name is Susan. I am a double major in math and philosophy, and today I want to talk to you guys about my philosophy honors thesis about the aesthetics of math. Now, contrary to popular belief, mathematicians often talk about beauty in their work. They use phrases such as a beautiful proof or an ugly equation. In fact, a study done in 2014 using fMRI scans on a group of mathematicians found that the equation people most consistently rated as ugly was this one. And they found that the equation most consistently rated as beautiful was this one. So what's going on here? This question motivated my honors thesis, which I conducted with the advice of Professor Michaela McSweeney. And typical to the research methods used in philosophy, I approached this thesis by first reading the existing literature in the philosophy of mathematics and trying to identify some sort of gap or issue that they've missed, and then constructing my own account to explain that gap. And as I was reading through the literature, there were many ideas that were floating around, but one of them kept coming up over and over again. It's this notion of mathematical understanding. And a lot has been written connecting mathematical understanding to beauty, but I felt that none of the current theories about it quite captured how I personally experience math and how I know some of my friends experience math as well. So what do I mean by mathematical understanding? Up on the slide, I have three different ways to think about understanding, and I want to clarify that I'm just talking about the third thing. We're not talking about the first two. So say we have some theorem, which is essentially a statement in math that we want to prove is true. The first notion of understanding of this theorem we can have is simply understanding what this theorem means, understanding what it means for something to be a product, for something to be three consecutive natural numbers, what it means to be divisible, divisible by six. And once we have this fairly simple notion, we might want to ask, well, is this true? So to understand or to know that a theorem is true, you need a proof for this theorem. Now, this proof is a, a little complicated, and we're not going to really have to understand all of these steps. The essential thing I want you guys to get from this proof is that what this is doing is, first of all, it shows that it's true. You just kind of got to take my word on it. And secondly, the way it does this is that it represents the uh, consecutive natural numbers in algebraic terms. So the parentheses with n plus 1, n plus 2, n plus 3, those are supposed to represent the three numbers. And it does some algebraic simplification, and eventually you get the result that their product is always divisible by 6. Now I want you guys to compare this proof with the one that I will provide next. This proof says when you have three consecutive natural numbers, because there's three in a row, at least one of them's got to be even divisible by 2, and at least one of them's got to be divisible by 3. So their product has to be divisible by both 2 and 3, and thus divisible by 6. If you look at these two proofs next to each other, it may feel like there's already an intuitive difference between what they're offering you. And when I was looking at these proofs, they kind of made me think of the two equations I was looking at before. <laughs> and I was wondering, what is this intuitive commonality that I'm sensing here. I don't think it's just explained by the fact that the better math in both examples is the one that's shorter or the one that's more simple. I think the simplicity of Euler's formula and the better proof is more so incidental than the actual cause of what makes the thing more beautiful or what makes it more explanatory. So what is it that makes it more explanatory? How does this proof give you better understanding? This is a bit of a tricky question to ask about math because normally when we ask for understanding of why something is the case, we want to know the cause of the thing. But in mathematics, there aren't really such causal relationships. So what sorts of relationships are we looking for when we look for deep understanding of math? This is the question I tackled mostly with my paper. I tried to construct a theory for what it means to understand mathematics, and using that theory, I then answer all of the questions that I had asked previously. The gist of my theory is that when you have a theorem like the one we just looked at, to truly understand this theorem is to understand how the objects in this theorem, such as the object, three consecutive natural numbers, and the final object, the product, and divisibility by six, how all of these things connect to each other. And I think both proofs does this fairly well. But the first proof is not as good as giving you an understanding of these connections in a cohesive way. That is, you kind of lose track of the connections when you start looking at the algebraic simplification. 
the number that n plus 1 is supposed to represent kind of disappears once you multiply it out across the various equations. Whereas in the second proof, the connections are very clear throughout. And after reading the proof, you can almost step back and see all of the connections at once and sort of grasp all of them and understand the sort of structure that's underlying the math. I'm being quite hand-wavy hand with the notion of structure, but in my paper, I do try to define it in a bit more technical way because there's a lot of debate amongst metaphysicians about math in terms of what a structure actually is. So that is something that has to be clarified. But if you do accept that that is a fairly accurate account of mathematical understanding, then I claim that what makes the second equation here mo more beautiful is the same thing that makes the second proof more explanatory. And that is, the second equation is more beautiful because, one, it's easier to grasp. The um, connections in there are, are more simple. Maybe that's where simplicity comes in. And you can kind of step back and just understand, yeah, exponentiation plus equal sign. Those are pretty simple operations. But more crucially, the second equation connects objects together that are more deeply important to mathematics than the first equation. The second equation connects together the concepts of pi, which makes you think of a circle, and the concept of i, the, uh, the imaginary numbers in the complex plane. And it connects this with the fundamental notions of unity expressed in one, and the notion of nothingness in zero. And it connects all of these huge, important concepts in such a simple way. Whereas the first equation, it's extremely complicated, and all it really does is give you an estimation of the value of 1 divided by pi, which is very powerful, but it may seem less cohesive or less explanatory than the second one. There are also a bunch of other parallels between um, these things, but I won't go through every single one of them, but I do want to show you this whole list to emphasize the fact that these parallels between the notion of understanding I've identified and the notion of an aesthetic experience are parallels that are fairly important for philosophers who are in the philosophy of, of aesthetics to the point where they give these notions very technical, jargony sounding names like directly and affectively experienced, which essentially means you, you got to be there to see it. You, you can't just like think about a piece of art and then feel beauty from it. Um, and if you accept that there are these parallels, then the takeaway that I would like to leave people with is that it's very plausible, I, I haven't offered a foolproof argument, but I think it's very plausible that the motivations for mathematics, or pure mathematics at least, is intrinsically and fundamentally an aesthetic motivation. And furthermore, understanding and aesthetics may be related in this way in other fields as well. Any field where you have this sort of structure of distilling a cohesive sense or a cohesive structure from disparate data and then expressing what you've distilled to others may have this uh, connection between understanding and beauty. Thank you so much. Question. Great presentation. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on theorems or results in math where the statement of a theorem is really beautiful, quote unquote beautiful, but then the way you prove that theorem is sometimes very messy or what we like to call uglies. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think that kind of gets at the notion that when you talk about what's beautiful, it's important to identify the object that you are appreciating. So maybe in those cases, we do find the structure expressed by the theorem to be very beautiful, but then the proof itself we just don't find beautiful, and that's fine because the theorem might be expressing, you know, the connect like the Euler's identity formula, right? It expresses these connections between these things, and then the proof might involve a bunch of other objects and a bunch of other concepts, and that's not beautiful anymore because it gets too complicated, and I think that's okay. Yeah. How do you see the beauty element as being dependent on the person who's looking at it? So somebody yeah. who has kind of no mathematical background versus somebody who's deep into it. 
Right. Do you see it as something that's common or something that might be dependent on that? Right, absolutely. So I think there's two parts to that. So first of all, I think it sort of is a prerequisite almost for you to be familiar with the mathematics to appreciate it, similar to the way where you have to be able to like be able to I think it's similar to the way where in some art you have to know the context to appreciate the art, like with certain historical paintings. I think it's a similar analogy. But then on the subjectivity thing, um, this is this slide, the idea that they're subjective. So this is the idea that um, in both understanding and in terms of beauty, there is this notion that it's up to your personal preference. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Different people might find different proofs to be more helpful for them, right? But despite these sort of differences between individuals, there is still a sort of general consensus that certain things are more beautiful than others. There's a general consensus that Van Gogh is more aesthetically valuable than a pile of dirt, even though there are still minute variations. And I think that is actually a parallel between the two things that sort of support my thesis that they might be really connected. Susan, can I ask you a question about um, one of the intriguing ways that you have thought about the depth of the relationality mm -hmm. in an equation being the source of the aesthetic value of that, yes. and then how that translates to, in your last slide, applications of this outside of math. Yeah. So if we think about beauty as really hinging on relational depth, how do you think about that in terms of other kinds of explanations? What might count for a beautiful explanation, say, in, I'll take my own feed, in like anthropology or in psychology or in anything else like where does the where, where does the beauty lie there yeah I think that's a that's tough because I don't want to speak about fields that I personally don't have experience in so I think in one sense I can answer it in terms of explanations as being beautiful in general and I think what it means for an explanation to be beautiful is this sort of rhetorical beauty almost where it's it's very logical or like it's well formulated or something there's that part of it but then there's also this idea that um it's, I don't think I want to say that all beauty has the structure. I'm not saying that all beauty is understanding. I think I'm more trying to say that all cases of understanding are also cases of aesthetics or cases of some form of beauty. It's like this other direction, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.